All right. Welcome and thank you for being here. I'm Paige Morris, the student representative for the Glass Art Society. Before we get the program started, we have a few logistics to cover and online community practices to review. We will be recording today's program and posting it on our YouTube channel. So while we hope you will keep your cameras on, only do so if you're comfortable. We also ask that you keep yourself on mute unless you are speaking. If you have any questions or comments, we would love to hear them. And because we know people engage in different ways, you're welcome to grab the microphone and unmute yourself to speak. You can use the raise hand function so our moderators see you have something to say, or you can use the chat box. We will try our best to address all questions. Closing extra tabs on your device can help avoid video delays or glitches. So now would be a good time to go ahead and close anything you don't need. As our online community practices go, we ask that everyone be respectful, speak from their own experience, and challenge yourself not to make assumptions. Instead, ask questions and go deeper. We also want to acknowledge that some of us are currently on indigenous lands and all across the world, people are dealing with issues of colonialism. For those of you who haven't been to a GAS student meetup program before, they are monthly virtual meetings meant to create a space for students from around the world to discuss glass materials and processes, view lectures and demos, attend virtual studio tours, meet leaders in the glass community and more. With all that being said, I'm going to hand this over to Renoy Imada, who will be our moderator for today. Thank you so much, Renoy, for uh, creating this programming. Hi, thank you so much for inviting us. Okay, hello. Uh, welcome to May Goss Student Meetup. I am Renoy Imada from Rochester Institute of Technology. I am the one of the student Ryerson for the GAS too. Um, and also organizer for this International Artist Conversation Series. Today, I invited four international students, Injun Ri from Rochester Institute of Technology, Saib Moles from Southern Illinois University Carbondale, Shiki Wu from Rhode Island School of Design, and Theo Brooks from Boring Gray a Boring Green State University to share their experience of being out, of, out from their home country to pursue their study for master's degree with GLASS. Starting with the slide of each person's background story and their current art practices, we are going to discuss details of their school experiences and COVID responses. If you have any question to us, please do drop in the chat box at the moment of the discussion. So let's start it, start from the slide. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. So started from Injun Ri. So I'm gonna hand it to Injun. Hi everyone, I'm Injun Li. Uh, I'm Lin Jun from Taiwan. I'm from Taiwan. Uh, now I'm currently in Rochester Institute of Technology. We just call it RIT. Next slide. You can just play the video and then I'll talk at the same time. Okay. While we are, uh, so while we are watching, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my work. Sorry, give me one sec. Okay. <laughs> Can you see the video? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I primar primarily works with film and glass, observing the glass making process, using videos and image to tell the stories. In RIT, uh, our school is located in the birthplace of Kodak, the film company Kodak. So even though like film, like traditional filming is not any, is not as popular as before, but the Kodak vibe still uh, stay in this in this town, in this influence in the cultural way and educational aspect. I had we had a really amazing pr pr photography program that we can borrow equipment from them. So it allows me to use this resource to put it into my art practice. We have two professors, uh, one technicians. 
uh, our professors, David and Susie. And one of them is like a poem and one is like an activist. So my work is really like a combination of these two, these two person. Okay, next, next slide. If you are interested in uh, finish this video, you can go to uh, my website. Okay, so this is a timeline that I, and uh, the, the part that I'm gonna cover in this presentation. Uh, in 2000, I graduated, my undergrad is architecture and design. After graduating in 2017, uh, I work in the gallery. So I work in a gallery. And in that gallery, I help an artist and glass artist, Ziji Kazumi, to arrange her show in Taiwan. And that is the first time I fall in love with, with glass. So I asked if I can work for her. So she brought me to Japan. I learned from her for work for her for one year and uh, come back in Taiwan to work as a glass blowing instructor for two years. But during those two years uh, in the summertime, I all went to Pilchuck. That is like the first first time Pilcha really made me want to start to think about applying for grad school in the United States. Uh, and then, so I went to uh, Rochester Institute of Technology in 2019. And uh, I want to say that for everyone who's graduating this year, like two thirds of our, our time in graduate school is covered in COVID. I think we did a good job finishing it. Next slide. So I'll start from my undergrad project. So uh, I studied architecture and then my thesis during undergrad is to build a, a space, a scenery for one of the book. The book is called A Journey to the West, Xi Okay, next slide. And after I graduate, I work in a gallery as a graphic designer. Next slide. I went to Japan and even though it's a, it's a glass blowing studio, but I still need to need someone to co-work. So most of my job is covered in just co-work. Okay, next slide. Then after I leave, left Japan, I work in Taiwan in a, as a glass blowing instructor teaching many students. Uh, during those two years, I got kind of tired of touching glass. So I think I, uh, going to the grad school, switch to a conceptual part of class really fit me. Next slide. And uh, during those time, I took two classes in Pilchuck. I would say that if you are from overseas and you want to apply for um, like schools in America, some take some summer class in the beginning to kind of taste it to see if it fit you or not. It's a really great idea. And during those two sessions, I met a lot of people and then built up my, my network, network. Okay, next slide. Well, one tip for applying for schools. Uh, so after I took two classes in Pilchard, I really want to apply for school and I start to prepare my portfolio. For, I think you don't need to worry if your portfolio are not all glass work. I think all kinds of artwork are are welcome to put in there. Okay, next slide. After I got into RIT, my work is, my art practice is mostly about experimenting, drawing, writing, performing, and filming. Next. So this is before, obviously before COVID, I blow, I asked my participant to blow sugar into my mouth. Next slide or draw, uh, draw keyboards in the hot shop and ask everyone to write into uh, write words in there. Next slide. And then COVID strike. So most of my work from performance kind of turn into videos or videos or drawings. Next slide. So let's go back to uh, the beginning of like this, this chart. 
I think the most important thing I want to tell people who want to apply for schools is to meet, like, don't be shy to ask questions. Like, even you can like, follow the professor's Instagram or some artists you, you really admire, like shoot them an email or message, ask them question like about like which school did you go to like what feature what what do you like features i think no one is going to most people will probably uh, like uh, reply so don't be shy and uh, ask a lot of questions this is uh our professor david schnackel did you put Susie? <laughs> no? you didn't put Susie? okay oh um I just put the head of the department for each part. So, yeah, so like, uh, um, I'm from RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology. And this is uh, our professor, David Schnuckel. So I put the email address. So if you need to reach out to him, just don't hesitate to do that. So, okay, thank you, Injun. Thank you. Okay, uh, Saif, uh, I'm gonna hand it to you next. Okay, great. Hey everyone. So my name is Saiv Moulds. It sounds like five, but with an S. Next. So I come from Dublin, Ireland. Um, a little town, or it's the capital city actually on the east coast of the island. Next. <clears throat> and I first discovered glass in the National College of Art and Design, Dublin. Um, and I graduated from here in 2014 with a bachelor in craft design, specifically in glass. Next. So after I graduated, I moved to Germany and I started an internship in Berlin Glass, which at the time was a really small um, non-for-profit non -for glass studio. Um, I ended up staying there for five years and I was helping with commissions for pretty well-known um, contemporary artists and designers, but I was also very much involved in their community outreach program. Next. So in 2019, I moved to the States where I started my MFA in the Southern Illinois University Carbondale. And I've just finished my second year of a third year program. Next. So for our first semester um, in SIU, our professor Ji Young Lee has us doing what he calls one week projects for the entire first semester. So that's 12 weeks of 12 critiques and 12 uh, one week projects. So I just included a few of them here. Um, and I can really see here where my interests are starting to really shine through things about body and social issues and stuff. Next. <clears throat> So my current research um, revolves really a lot around human consciousness and the ways in which our mind can be controlled and influenced very much from society and our environments. I also started working a lot more with um, hyper-realistic techniques, so using a lot of silicone casting and things like that. Next. So this was my first project after the one week projects. So this is my first thing after uh, for the second semester, but right before COVID hit. So it's kind of the only thing I really got to go all the way through with for my first year. Next. So this for this piece, I was thinking a lot about um, the way society really can shape the way we think and feel about our body um, and kind of the constructs that we live inside. Next. So this is just silicone, foam, float glass, and some body hair. Next. Okay, so now I'm getting into all the work that I made this year, or some of the work I made this year. <clears throat> this piece is called Blood of Zine. And this is all mold blown, cold worked, and then picked back up and assembled hot. Next. So I was thinking a lot with this piece about um, the relationship between consciousness or the dawning of consciousness um, and the ancient connection that has with menstruation. Next. So a lot of my work actually has, um, or this year, a lot of my, my background, my Catholic background growing up in Ireland kind of came through in a lot of my work. So this piece was kind of a rejection of the 
the biblical idea that um, menstruation was a direct result of original sin. Next. So this is a, a piece from the same um, series called Taboo. And again, thinking about uh, the very common idea that menstruation is taboo or shouldn't be talked about and kind of exploring that next. Next. <clears throat> yeah, and like, so skin is a really important thing within my work. Um, and especially with these, the last two pieces, um, when I think about things like the, the skin of a woman and the, the connotations that presumes in, in modern society. Next. Okay, this has been my biggest and most ambitious piece in grad school. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone <laughs> to try and achieve something with such crazy deadlines and all these other things to be doing. Next. Yeah, so this is my first attempt at a full to scale silicone figure. Um, I was thinking a lot, again, about consciousness with this piece and the way in which we define it, um, how we assume superiority because of it. Um, next. So this is silicone. There's a lot of materials in this. <laughs> Um, silicone, steel, bronze, glass, fiberglass, resin, uh, hair, of course. Yeah, next. I just wanted to include this slide because you always want to see the backside of these things. <laughs> next. <clears throat> So I made this piece actually really quickly after I made the, the previous one. The previous one took maybe three or four months. Um, it was really stressful. And then this I made in a matter of days, which was, was pretty refreshing. This is just silicone and bra fixings. Um, I was really focusing on the detachment that a lot, a lot of us have with our bodies. Um, yeah, it was a simple one. It was fun. Next. Yeah, just some close-ups. So I'm really getting into the reaction or the, the relationship that we have with our bodies and specifically our consciousness, how, how we all kind of perceive things very differently. Next. Next, sorry, a lot of images. <laughs> so this is my most recent piece. I just finished this last week. It's called Impressionable. It's just two silicone busts facing each other. Next. So I was thinking more about the subconscious with this piece. I wanted to try and make it less um, heavy and meta kind of. So I was focusing a lot on how our subconscious has these patterns to mimic and absorb those around us. Next. So this is just silicone foam and kiln formed and mirrored glass it's pretty, on hair, of course, and some jewelry. Yeah, and again, um, kind of asking questions like if any of us are really and truly original or if we're all just fragmented reflections of each other, I guess. Next. And I think that's it, next. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Saif. And here's the Saif's professor, Jion Lee's like, uh, information. So if you guys like are interested in uh, so SIU, like uh, please like a uh, contact, of course, like uh, maybe Saif too, but like also Jion yeah. is al always open. <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much. Okay, um, uh, let's go to Shiki. <laughs> Um, hey, uh, I'm, I'm Shiki, and I come from China. Now I'm a second year grad student in uh, Rowland School of Design. Um, so first I want to talk about uh, why I come to RISD. Okay, next one. So, um, the um, glass, casting glass, and uh, my undergrad was learning about uh, 
mixed media painting, but it in this program related to some um, craft craft materials like um, metal, glass, and sculpt sculpture. Later out of four years, I decided to uh, focus on glass this material. So I applied um, Shanghai University. There's, o there's also MFA uh, uh, program um, and teach about uh, uh, kiln casting. And uh, then, uh, okay, next one. And uh, uh, in our school, we were focused on large scale kiln casting. So I made a lot of different size, different color, um, kiln casting works, next. And this is our show in a, in a gallery and it contains students and teachers work, next. Uh, this is our king and um, we usually make this metal box and contain a um, uh, pilaster inside. And this is quite heavy, big, uh, really huge size. Okay, next one. And later in, in, in three years in Shanghai University, I was um, have a chance to visit a Chinese traditional factory. And it, the place is kind of um, um, have glass blowing and also flame working. I, I was helping them design um, some projects and to help them increase their, uh, their selling. Next. And you can see there, some of workers, they are, um, they are working so hard and uh, the equipment is kind of old. Like, as I know, this kind of factory before it around, was around 300 people work together, but now just 30 people. So it's kind of a lot of young people, they don't want welding to um, keep going, work with glass blowing. And you know, it's kind of really hard um, labor, labor uh, force um, uh, techniques. Next. Uh, so it's, it's still some of furnace of them. Okay, next. Uh, yeah, and also took some pictures. Um, it's quite interesting. They make all of the glass by themselves. They mix all the powder. So some of the color is not that pretty. And, um, um, and um, the shape, they always use, uh, use kind of really traditional. It's hard to try some new um, idea with the project. Next. And now I want, I want to talk about um, recently my two of my works. It, it will show in my um, final graduation exhibition. So the first one poem is carried by Hermit Krabs. Next. So this work is kind, kind of come, come from an idea um, like I saw a watch or video uh, from YouTube. So next one. So you can see here, there's a homie crab where uh, um, toys hands uh, and uh, walking back to the ocean slowly. So after I watched this video, I have an idea. I want to make something, make a, make a gift for the homie crab. Next one. And I did some research, so you guys all know glass is kind of uh, environment friendly, and it, it comes from the, the sand from ocean. And uh, I'm thinking about how I make the glass, let it come back to the, go back to the sea again. Next. And uh, in, this, in this cold situation, it's hard to go someplace, but it was really lucky I met uh, staff in a, Marine Science Library. Uh, she sees the stuff inside and she introduced me to the library, did some research about Rhode Island local hermit crab. And I get some re really useful information to design the size of a glass shell. Next. I was here, this is the, this is the library. Next one. Um, uh, after for a while, I, I think about just make a, uh, glass shell is kind of normal because already people, a lot of people did it. So I'm thinking about to add something uh, like personal content inside. So I'm thinking about add some traditional Chinese poems um, in the uh, like engraved on the 
glass shell is kind of like like the hermit crab carry the poem carry my my memory and back to the ocean next one so here's some details it's hard to see on the on the on these images but it actually you can see by your by your eyes thank next one so this is a process after i finished um designed the, the shells um i was looking for the hermit crab in the ocean but uh, because of the weather, the season, um, the water is really cold. I couldn't find any hermit crab in this in these days. Next one. So I, I just take took some images to mimic the moment. I want to see the hermit crab with its glass shells walking back to the ocean slowly. Next. Uh, so it's still some detail of the, the work, next one. Uh, so the next one is missing bricks, next. Uh, this is an intersection near Wisty campus. Every time when I cross this insect, um, this gap kind of losing around 10 bricks, I always have kind of um, a feeling, want to fill, fill, fill in this gap. So I'm thinking about my major, think about glass material. I decided to uh, make some glass, glass bricks to fill inside. Next. And also I contain some traditional uh, Chinese poem. When, when people waiting for the tra tra traffic lights, they kind of uh, have a moment to stand there and uh, read this Chinese poem. And it has, um, um, uh, Chinese version and an uh, English version. Next. So this is some details. Next. And this is the, 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 the image I was uh, cleaning the dots in that gap. Next. Uh, next. Okay, now I want to talk about a little bit about, about our uh, recent glass department. Next, um, in our uh, we now we call uh, glass department. Actually, we you also can think about we as a conceptual sculpture uh, department because we our work not just can use glass, but we can work with a lot of different material and. Um, uh, like um, you can work with uh, performance and uh, with glass material and also make some insulation, painting, um, um, material experiments, anything you, you want. Next. And this is in, uh, in this COVID situation, uh, we just keep distance and uh, you, we use a kind of machine to, uh, we don't have to and directly below below the glass by by pipe, we use a machine to press the air inside. Next. So this is just some student they did some hard cutting. Next. Yeah, still this process. Next. Oh, and also because in in the hot shop we. We couldn't couldn't like let all students inside, so we usually separate two groups. So one of the groups um, in the hot shop and the other group was in the classroom. There is a camera. Uh, student can uh, in the in the classroom. There's a t television. We can uh, watch the, the the live video in the room. Next. So we also. Each of glass student have have a, a, a personal studio. Next, it's around ten by ten feet. So this is mine. I just take some uh, pictures. Uh, let you guys to see it. Next, yeah, and it's really old traditional uh, building. Next, okay, uh, still next. Okay, that's all. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah, uh, 
if you need if you are interested in like a con uh talk asking about Rhode Island School of Design more uh here here's a Jocelyn Prince the professor address so if um you can reach out to them thank you Shiki thank you so much okay um Theo last but not least hello everyone um I'm Theo Brooks I'm um, a grad student at Bowling Green State University in Ohio and um I'm completing a Master of Fine Arts in 3D Studio Arts. Uh, next slide, please, Renoy. So I'm from London, UK, England, um, home of fish and chips and pubs and Big Ben. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. <laughs> um, so after completing my, uh, uh, my BFA from uh, the University for the Creative Arts Farnham, I went and apprenticed under a glass blower called Simon Moore, um, who's based in London as well. Um, so here we, we did mainly production work and design for factories uh, in Europe. Um, so these are just some examples of some of the pressed factory designs as well as some of the hand blown factory designs, as well as some of Simon's work. Uh, next slide, please. So after working with Simon, I went on to work with uh, Philip Baldwin and Monica Gugitsberg in Paris, France. Um, this was my first kind of exposure to uh, glass art, as before this, it had mainly been production um, studios or factories that I worked in. Um, so here I was an in-house glass cutter and uh, glass assistant and general studio assistant. Uh, next slide, please. So just before coming to the US, I was um, again working in another production place, um, making glass lighting at a place called Rothschild and Bickers Lighting. Um, so it was kind of here where I had been making work or assisting at different uh, studios and I kind of wanted to get back to making my own work again. Uh, next slide, please. So this was kind of my first uh, first attempt at uh, creating a, a sculpture. <laughs> before uh, before this, I had mainly been doing uh, blown vessels and you know decorative uh, pieces for the home, so to speak. So this was my first kind of attempt at, at trying to uh, move into that kind of art world. Um, so this is a water jet cut piece that's then uh, hand cut, and it all just like slots together. <laughs> Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I finally arrived in the US. And uh, these are just some of the examples of uh, the work that I made um, uh, just before, well, in, in the first part of the first year until um, we were kicked out for quarantine. Um, so next slide, please, Renaud. So um, although I grew up in London, um, in England, um, my mum, she is from Cyprus, so that um, uh, my family home is kind of Cypriot in culture. So uh, the summer before coming uh, to the US, I uh, went back to Cyprus and uh, I was lucky enough to go around the Cyprus Museum. And um, uh, there's kind of been a lot of different like reasons and connections back, obviously, to Cyprus, but for me, there was still like this kind of displacement, um, you know, from growing up in another kind of country and uh, everything seemed, um, you know, mysterious still. So I ended up doing a lot of research during my time here into the ancient artifacts of Cyprus, predominantly from like around 2000 BC. So there was Ascos vessels, like the kind of ball shapes in the bottom left, um, right on vessels, which were used um, uh, during all these kind of libation and uh, ritual ceremonies. So a lot of the focus of the research um, was about kind of the cultural side of these ancient rituals and, you know, the reasons for them, how all the different like objects and ceramic pieces were used during these rituals. So that was kind of what like captured my imagination. And um, from then on, I, I wanted to create a body of work that was based on all of these artifacts that I was um, discovering. And um, 
for more like personal side of it, my grandpa, um, the village that he grew up in uh, is right next to one of the ne like oldest Neolithic sites in um, Cyprus. So the, um, you know, as a kid, he would go out into the fields and collect these kind of ancient artifacts. And um, he, in the museum, there was a whole section of, of stuff from that village. So it was kind of nice little connection back to like the objects I was seeing. Um, so uh, next slide, please, Renoy. Uh, so these are just some of the, the kind of uh, reinvention of some of those objects. So the, the Ascos vessels and those ball-shaped um, vessels were, um, were used in, in, very, in many different ways in these ceremonies. Like they were markers of like ritual space or, um, you know, as protective, uh, objects for the ritual. Um, so I kind of took those and modernized them and, and added my own little twist on most of the objects. Um, so as you see, there's a lot of like goblets and uh, pouring vessels and these kind of uh, bull horned objects. Uh, next slide, please. So again, some larger uh, kind of jug pieces, um, you know, still with this focus on the, the bull as um, the bull uh, was seen as this uh, very sacred animal. And in these rituals, there was a lot of sacrificing of oxen in the same spaces that they were, um, they were creating metal. So the bull uh, during the, that period was known as the Bronze Age in Cyprus. So a lot of the, um, uh, the, a lot of the, the metal working that was happening, the bull was, was like the symbol of craft as well. So uh, that was kind of why I wanted to focus on these uh, kind of zoomorphic um, vessels and create my own. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so a lot of the, the, the kind of techniques that I use are, are mainly in the hot shop and cold shop and kind of combining the two. So there's this kind of play between hot and cold. So a lot of these balls are, are blown in the hot shop and uh, layers of uh, coloring like this one, for instance, through uh, different techniques of either Swedish overlay or stuff cupping to create layers, um, and then um, carving back through some of these layers. Um, next slide, please. Uh, here's another example of one of these ball pieces made in the same way. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, something I had kind of touched on during my time here at uh, Bowling Green, um, especially with the influence of like the break for COVID um, was 3D printing. So something that I'm kind of working on currently slash had been over the period of time is this combination of uh, blown glass and or hot sculpted glass as well, I guess solid glass and um, 3D printing, predominantly just with PLA um, and uh, trying to combine them in a way that kind of plays of the the natural, what I think is like beautiful qualities of PLA. So kind of using some of the faceting and stuff that you get from designing in like Maya or SketchUp um, to kind of uh, reflect or um, kind of work harmoniously with uh, like faceted and cut glass. Um, so there's other research that I had been doing during my time here, but all of these pieces that, I, uh, that we just kind of looked through were predominantly the things that were shown in the, the uh, end of year show. And um, uh, that, that's it, on to the next slide. <laughs> and that's my contact details. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you, Theo. It was pretty, pretty hot. Lots of like a inspirational information. And here's uh, Ali Hoog, right? <laughs> um, she's the uh, professor in the board glass professor in the Boring Green State University. So if you are interested in contact with her, uh, here's the information too. So yeah, thank you. So I'm gonna stop share my screen, come back to the group. <laughs> okay, so now I'm gonna move on to the discussion part. So I have uh, some like a uh, sets of the question then I'd like to ask you guys, but also I I think I'm gonna drop my question in the chat box. So uh, 
maybe we're not gonna get like a loss like what I'm asking or whatever. Okay, so I'm just gonna drop first question in the chat box. So like, uh, I see like a many like a um, students work, then that's all beautiful and like really fascinating. Then I'm really curious, like, um, what characteristics of each institution from you guys like influence like your art practice or maybe not it's fine but like uh, what do you think um who if you if you're ready to go just go for it <laughs> um can i go yeah sure. <laughs> um I don't know if it's like a characteristic of SIU or anything, but because Jiyoung does those one week projects um, when you first get into school, to be honest, it's really frustrating and very, very intense, but it does really help to like expand your mind and it does kind of get like a lot of people are reluctant to break away from what they've usually been working on. And I understand that, um, but to do these one week projects kind of helps you to like really find your own interests and, and find your voice within those interests. And I think that actually helped me a lot, even though I absolutely hated it at the time, you know, I think it, it really, really helps my work. Yeah, that's like, a sounds really intense. Like, I think maybe Injun gonna have some, <laughs> like uh, maybe similar in, uh, in, uh, experience like we, what we had as a uh, last semester like do you want to talk about it Injun? Uh, I think we have many studio visits so studio visit is kind of like uh, professor well professor or students other students or other teachers that are gonna come to see your work like almost like every week yeah it's kind of, yeah it's kind of tired but it will bring you fresh opinion from different people it's a good way to push you further yeah we had a yeah. uh, hundred gestures <laughs> yeah we have like so like Seth has like one week project we have like a hundred gesture kind of like a <laughs> hundred but in one month <laughs> not one week one month okay okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah well well i think um yeah, yeah he, here at a, a bowling green um i'm not sure it's probably a characteristic that is, you know, amongst all the other institutes too. But what I've really enjoyed here is um, the ability to go between different apart, uh, departments. So, you know, um, for a lot of the end of your show, I include a lot of CNC cutting and uh, using the sculpture area, welding, metalworking. Um, there's quite a lot of freedom here as a grad student to work between and every, all, all the professors want to work with you as well. And um, uh, and, and that was definitely one of the reasons why I ended up coming here is uh, it wasn't more like, what can you do for us? It's like, hey, we have all this stuff that you'd love to do and enjoy. And um, I think coming uh, back to school, obviously, after, you know, working in the professional world, that's exactly what you want, want people to collaborate with and um, uh, but also learn new skills that is difficult in the real world, you know, for people to take the time out of their, you know, um, uh, uh, working you know kind of things that are funded by money and cost uh, uh you know would cost your employer or whatever everyone is very open here and um that's something that's really positive about this place great oh <laughs> uh, yeah i can talk about a little bit related to RISD. um i i have like three year pro program so actually the first time first year i was focusing on uh, technique for, for the learning techniques because I don't have any glass blowing uh, background. And then next year, um, it's like first year of grad students. So I was fo focusing on um, experiment, uh, material experiment to find some, something that I, I was interested in and, and then try to make some uh, conceptual experiment works is not have to relate it to glass. That's I think the most different um, things in RISD. We really focus on fine art, conceptual, um, techniques kind of support for our idea. And uh, uh, for the 
the, the last year, this year, and uh, we kind of each of our grad students, we have our own interaction. Some people focus on uh, body movement. Some people focus on storytelling. Some people would focus on optic research. So it's quite interesting. You have your own uh, perspective of the, the, the uh, to, to understand the glass. And um, this is like our department and also uh, we also we also have like studio visit each week and the artist lecture, and it's really good. good it's good chance to talk with them to get some feedback about your work, some questions you can ask to them, and also in the in the school we have nature lab. It's a place that you can find a lot of animal species. The, sa the sample you can uh, like if you like work with nature environment, they can help you. And also we have another place called CoWorks. It contains a lot of 3D, print, uh, 3D printer, laser cutter, UV printer, a lot of this kind of uh, uh, technical equipment you, which can support you uh, material, um, these kind of things. And uh, also the last one is we, each of in university, we really encourage each student to um, work with other major students, like not, uh, with design student architecture, like to find some uh, new, to design a new project with a different major. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, okay, uh, let's move on to the next one. Um, no one has oh, a question? Bryn yeah, I think we have a question. I have a question. Um, my name is Bronnie Sargison. I'm at the ANU School of Art and Design um, here in Canberra in Australia. Um, so it's, it's nearly 10 a.m. where I am. I don't know what, what everyone else's time is like. Um, I was just really curious. Um, ANU's had a massive influence on me personally and professionally um, with kind of regard to your question. Um, I think that influence has been, you know, connecting to communities overseas and um, also... Um, Kind of the local Canberra arts community um, outside of the university structure but um, we've had a massive shift here in just in the last year or so um, kind of as a response to COVID but also um, the ANU like the wider university body kind of absorbing the art school um, and making it more like the rest of the university. Um, I just wondered whether anyone else had sort of had um, come up against difficulties in terms of like accessing studios, um, learning some of those skills and techniques from um, lecturers. I know that's something that I really struggled with um, is not having time in the studio or time with lecturers. Um, and that's really shifted and changed a lot just in the last kind of year or so. Um, I just sort of wondered what other people's kind of responses were. Yeah, that's uh, a great question. That's like, a, yeah, just go for each of you guys. Uh, do you want to go start engine? Okay, yeah. I think for us, our studio access is the same amount. It's just like a little bit extra work that you have to book the studio so they can limit the capacity of each room. But like a lot of people are afraid that too many people are going to show up in studio so they don't show up. So it actually gives people who really want to learn a lot of plenty of time and space for your own self. Yeah. Um... In response to COVID, our studio access has not, like really fortunately, has not been affected at all. Um, Jiong didn't accept any first year grad students last year. So there was only four grad students. There's usually six and we didn't have any undergrads. So there was four of us that had like the entire run of the studio, um, 24 hour access, seven days a week, which coming from Ireland and our, the university I came from I mean it closed at nine every day and it wasn't open at the weekend so I was never used to having full access to the studios um also here compared to Ireland there's a a lot more back and forth between different studios and being able to use all the facilities um that wasn't really something I was used to either mm -hmm. so for me it's been a lot of fresh air and also the COVID thing yes it's been frustrating yes we have to wear masks and be more conscious about who we're around but it actually gave us more, more access really in the end. But we, I, like, I know in different parts of the country, it wasn't like that, you know? Yeah, that access is amazing. Like, yeah, we're limited to six, um, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. 
um, yeah. and no weekend access um, and also anything high risk we have to be supervised now um, so there's a lot of like extra work health and safety stuff I also um, am interested like I'm undergrad so I wonder whether it's different as well like if your um, master's or it is definitely in, in SIU it's definitely the grad students have more accessibility we, yeah. we have as much accessibility as the faculty do yeah that's amazing that's really cool yeah it's awesome yeah page four up like a more serious United States school for graduate student 24 hours access yeah mm. RIT has 24 hours access like seven days too so does that include um like glass blowing and like high risk yeah yeah activities yeah right amazing um Shiki and Tio, do you have uh, any follow up or <laughs> yeah um yeah we kind of really is kind of really strict um last year I think it's around last year, March 15, uh, our school like totally closed to every to every student, and uh, all of our studio and hot shop uh, couldn't allow anyone like inside anymore, and it and so a lot of students not whatever uh, uh, not just like grad student undergrad a lot of student kind of um, depression like really uh, upset. And so it that's kind of between March and uh, May, these three months. So all of our department class is kind of not that intense anymore. And uh, it, it becomes like each of student help each other to feel like feel better to talk we talk to each other. And then until September, all of the uh, our studio studio and the um, hot shop start to running again. And uh, it's like you also a little bit like your your school is kind of uh, you have to schedule each slot and you can use it. And also one room couldn't contain like it it depends with the size of the room. Like if the small room usually is around two three or four students one time. Um, and also a lot of uh, like even our store. Uh, so some student can buy the materials also. You have to make appointment by 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 our RISD app, so you that you can go there like in like thirty thirty uh, half an hour like this way. Um. So so for us here, obviously, when the the rest of the world went into quarantine, we did too. Um. But then when when we were allowed back, you know, we we have a have a pretty uh, strict like cleaning regime. So you come in, you sanitize your hands, you clean all the pipes. Um, we actually, um, you don't blow down any pipes anymore. So everyone got their own blow pipes. Um, we, we have these like pocket inflators they're called. So they're, you know, from spiral arts and, uh, you know, so we were able to, you know, work, work with an assistant, but still work safely. Um, you know, obviously masks, um, in, in everywhere in the school, um, I, I'm the only grad student in, in the glass department. So I, I have access here all the time. Um, I guess I was come, also coming from like a, a similar background to Sive, how, you know, in the, in the UK, in my undergraduate was, you know, you're kind of nine to five, you're in the studio and the weekends, maybe you'd, you'd go in and uh, assist like the technician or something. Um, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't have a chance to work on your own stuff. So obviously coming here and having like access all the time, you just want to be in here all the time making things. Um, because, you know, after, before coming here, I'm sure everyone's in the same position, you know, not having access to a studio or, or working for other people this time. And all of a sudden you're let in and you're like, make what you want. And you're like, oh my God, I'm going to live here. Um, <laughs> so um, it's, uh, it's, you know, the access, we, we have like schedule, scheduled uh, blow sessions. So, you know, a, as a grad student here, you, you can pick pretty much as many as you, you want um and then so we had like scheduled time for blow slots cold shop time um uh we you know classrooms only a certain amount of people are allowed in but usually like we, we have pretty large spaces here so our, our hot shops are, are pretty large well well like most hot shops well ventilated area so um uh, through the scheduling system we were able to work pretty safely in here 
Um, Theo, do you mind if I ask what, um, who do you, in terms of when you're working with someone for um, a hot shop, which is pretty usually pretty essential to have someone working with you, um, do you work with undergrad students or do you have people coming from outside the university that you work with? How do you kind of navigate that? So um, throughout the time here, it's, it's mainly been with uh, the undergraduates and sharing time with the tech yeah. technicians as well. So we had a technician here, Zach Wein Weinberg, and he, he was fantastic. And we would, we would make work together. So we would share yeah. our blow slots. So, you know, when, when you're working with your assistant here, you'd, because uh, at first, a lot of it was, um, uh, you know, when we first came back from COVID, we weren't sure of you know how safely we could work but we we haven't had any covid cases in here because everyone's been really good about you know what they're doing inside and outside the studio um you know uh, wearing your masks you know i guess like the closer someone would get to you would be if they were like shielding your arm if you're making you know something larger um but you know you're both wearing masks and and we've got giant paddles so it's great <laughs> um so uh in terms of that yeah so so actually coming into like the last semester here um the undergraduate that, or graduates that i've been working with um they all graduated so actually final year of a thesis was like okay uh new assistants new uh mm. everything so that was like a worry for a second but actually like you know um Ali and Joel were very supportive as well. So if there were things that maybe like um, some of the undergrads weren't able to do, they would like step in and help if I needed yeah. assistance. So um, every, this, the studio is pretty, everyone's like works really well as a team here. So it's, um, it's, it's pretty, pretty nice to have that, that help. Yeah. Cool. Do you find people um, at an undergrad level coming to university or graduating from university um, with a really different skill set compared to like a couple of years ago or someone like yourself who's had that experience in the professional um, sort of sphere and feel free anyone else to jump in. Um, I've just certainly noticed that um, like I will graduate university with um, a certain number of skills, but it's really different to, um, you know, a couple of years ago or like in the 80s and 90s, people would graduate from um, ANU with this amazing skill set ready to go in the professional sphere. And that's really shifted. Um, so I just wondered whether anyone had anything. I, I think that kind of depends on the student here, like, because you have really great access here. So it's like, if you want to work hard and you want to blow glass till the cows come home you can do that but if you you know you want to so the the way that the, the undergrad studio program works here is you can work in take hours in other departments so some of the students who aren't like 100% glass focused are also doing like ceramics or sculpture or photography so um, there seems to be this kind of blend of like people moving uh, between mediums so in terms of like the skill set you want to leave with it's it's kind of like uh your choice which is good yeah. um yeah I, I like it was really different at the school I went to it was like oh you have three years to do glass that's it yeah um yeah which, um yeah I, I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that um yeah <laughs> I don't know I think it, like Theo said I think it really depends on on the person and how much they make of the, the opportunities. You know, I, I didn't leave my undergrad with very many skills and the skills I got um, or the experience I, I've learned has definitely been through the professional um, work that I took after my undergrad. But I think that has helped a lot with my graduate work and not necessarily with my skills, but the way I think, um, the things I know are possible. You know, but I do think that it's important to remember that like coming to grad school, you're not, you're not really coming to grad school to learn skills off the professors there, you know, you're kind of already meant to have that under your belt, or at least be confident enough to expand by yourself. And I think, or at least with SIU, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a research, it's a public research institu institution. So you're there and they're, the professors are there to facilitate your research as opposed to teach you new skills and stuff. Yeah. So that was kind of hard for me to get used to because I wanted to expand on my skills. I wanted to become yeah. a really great 
cast over, you know. But, Especially if you didn't get that in your undergrad, like that's, yeah. yeah. And I, I really struggled with that. My undergrad was like, was difficult and we had a lot of problems in my final year. We, we broke the furnace, we didn't have anything to, like we couldn't blow or anything. So I felt like I, that was taken away from me, um, mm. but it's really what you make of it. Yeah. And the peers, like you do learn a lot from your professors, but you learn an awful lot of skills from your peers. So from the other people around you, from the mm. students. And it's sufficient, you're still learning, you know. Yeah, I agree. Like, uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm uh, actually like, uh, I moved from Japan, like, um, before undergrad. So I got a BA in United States, then just move on to the MFA in pursuing just like in here. Then um, I think I got, I got, got like a handful, like a skill for glass drawing, like in, I actually got it some, some in the undergrad and also I had the experience before undergrad too. So um, I can do something like what I have in my head <laughs> in, a, in a grad school, but like a, um, in, a, in here in grad school, I think I learn is like, I just, I think I have to more, um, research and experience like what like a uh, what like a uh, brought my interest and also like what like a uh, uh helps me to like a uh, uh what like a uh, it's not like a really tech um <laughs> we are learning technique but we are learning like how to build the concept i think so that's like a maybe kind of really big thing i think i learned from like my school <laughs> Do you think like uh, does your experience in United States like uh, maybe of course but like uh, give you a significant like a change or effect in your art practice with glass? Do you think? <clears throat> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big time. I think just having that amount of time to really focus on your own work. Um, and also to be forced to focus on your own work, you know, because there's constant deadlines, there's constant expectations from yourself and from from your peers and your professors. Mm -hmm. um, there's no choice but to really excel and like develop. Um, my work is drastically different and it's not that the theme of my work is drastically different, but you just have time and space to really explore things that you never thought that you would have the time and space to do. For me, anyway, of course. Do you guys think? What do you think? <laughs> I think like coming to the United States definitely influenced me a lot because it gave me a chance to be in part of, because the like the feminist movement here is like so much different than in Taiwan, and then being here really influenced me to catch up with the the newest idea, the newest concept, like about gender, about sexuality. Yeah, I think um, obviously be, being in uh, a Bowling Green, um, this is a really interesting like uh, area for glass. So there's a, a real long history here um, in, up the road in Toledo, which is like 20 minutes away. Um, so the Toledo Museum of Art is there and they have like the glass pavilion and stuff. So actually like being able to go there and see like the glass museum as well as like the main museum and stuff. It's like a real um, positive to being here and, you know, has affected the work. And um, uh, just like the community here is, is, is really nice as well. Like there's a small community in London as well. But, um, you know, considering how small Bowling Green and Toledo is, is like a, you know, a town and a city. Like there's a lot of glass studios around here. So, and I found coming here, everyone was like super wel welcoming. And, you know, I've been invited to do demos at like some of the studios and stuff. So like definitely the, um, you know, you're, you're able to go and see all the different type of glass making that the people around here are doing. Um, so that's definitely uh, a, a, a positive as well about the US, but also this particular institute. Um, 
before I was in I was in China, like I was really focused on techniques. So actually, one of the um, the goal to come to America is why I want to also learn some glass blowing, become glass blower, um, and um, uh, later I, I will. Uh, I was learning in something in RISD and my professor told me uh, because like a technical things you can learn outside of, of the school because you pay a lot of tuition in RISD, you should learn something uh, can, which can help you develop yourself for, the, for your future career. So like for technical things, you can learn in factory, studio, any, anything else, not just in school. And so they, they told me, they encouraged me to Help me build my um, kind of art systems. Like, uh, help me find the, the things that I, I am interested in and the, the ideas. Um, and uh, I think that's really helped me um, to 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 rethink about techniques and balance the idea with uh, with techniques. Of course, techniques is important. You make uh, your your work. You should know a lot of techniques, but also. Uh, your techniques also kind of way to support your idea, and your idea is kind of special. It's your your ideas, not other people's. Yeah. Yeah. Please draw something really like a interesting point, like about like a graduate assistantship program, then a program of, and also like a, um, there's a question like what have you, um, what it what have have been like some of your experience being with the assistantship like did you get any like a new skills or like a new experience of course <laughs> but like, do you have any like a uh some like a really like something like a, you think like a very significant you uh, think? Can, can i add to that too renoi yeah. um since most of the time, I don't want to say for certain, but most of the time those assistantships are also tied to funding. So maybe that's something that the panelists can touch on too, since going to graduate programs can be really costly. So what does funding kind of look like and what are maybe some of the expectations um, attached to the assistantships? Yeah, so for me, I without an assistantship, it just wouldn't be possible for me to study in the United States at all, 100%. But with the assistantship, I mean, I there's an opportunity to work um, quarter time or half time. So that means 10 hours or 20 hours per week, which is an awful lot on top of the ridiculous hours you have to pull anyway. But having an assistantship means that your tuition is waived and it means that you get a salary per month, um, which is really essential, especially because for an international student, um, American tuition is just really, really outrageous, which is why SIU is, is a very, SIU Glass specifically is a really popular um, program for international students. But on top of that, on top of the, the awesomeness of actually getting paid to come here, um, yeah, you, you get to teach, you get to, gain experience teaching in a university setting, as well as opportunities to do shop tech. You don't, you also don't have to work within your program. You can do um, work in the sculpture program, or we have a museum, we have an art education program. So depending on what your interests are and what your previous experience is, you can really choose how you wanted to, to develop them at a, at a university level. And that's something that really, really, I think will stand to you after you graduate. Um, in in RISD, you all of our grads also have um, assistantship, like uh, every week work for around eight hours, and um, uh, and uh, you usually it's like you you have some background or you have some experience with this class, or you take this class before, and you can become the TA uh, in in class, and also not just you can work in our department, you also can work in other other place like language center, if you, your English is super good. And also uh, our nature lab, you view really interesting with animal, with nature. And also if you are good with coding, some techniques with uh, uh, 3D printing, this kind of things, you can work in co-works. So, and also library, a lot of places you can work to get the assistantship. 
Renoi, do you want to say answer this one? <laughs> oh, me? <laughs> You're the presenter today. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the GA, the assistant, she helped me to pay the rent every month. So I think it's, uh, it's really, really helpful. And then uh, teaching, teaching other students give us a chance to see like, sometimes people just have like groundbreaking new technique. So when teaching undergrad, they have like really like great idea, really inspiring ideas. Yeah, like this just additional like uh, this semester, I'm I'm a co-teaching like hot shop. I was co-teaching like a hot shop this semester. Like it's like <laughs> it's really fun to like uh, talk with somebody who never like even like who never like uh, seen glass blowing before, but just like uh, suddenly interested in like what is glass then just like uh, getting to the studio then just involving like hot, hot molten glass then like their work is really special like it's um totally like they brought us a really new aspects to like a scene seeing through with the glass so i really like i i really like a uh, being ta but also like yeah like a uh, rit have uh, like uh, 18 hours for uh graduate assistantship uh for like uh, maybe second year um we do have another things to do, like clean up coal shop, like a coal shop boss or kiln shop boss or like a hot shop, like a um, accommodator, like so something like those kind of stuff. I think definitely those are like some like a places we never experience it, but like uh, they um, set us anyway. But also that's like a really like a new, um, opportunity to really learn things then after these are definitely like after the school if I want to work in a, like some kind of studio maybe that's helpful too so that's really good too. Theo do you have anything? <laughs> so the the way the graduate um, assist assistantship uh, works here is um, in the the first year as in, in glass anyway the first year you are a TA um to to Ali and uh you know you you help teach the classes and then in the second year in the first semester you you have your own glass class so you teach um your own course for that semester and then the other semester uh you teach one of the foundation classes so um in the first year um my time was split up though because they needed help in some of the other departments so I was Although I was TAing, I was also working in the metals department as well. So uh, you have to do like 15 hours. So you kind of, uh, I was split 10 hours in glass and then five hours in the metals department. Um, so uh, you, you get given a, a, you know, your stipend, the same as everyone else, I assume. Um, there are some extra fees as well that you have to pay though. Um, that uh, I guess as an international student, I didn't, realize uh, as the scholarships work different at the university I went to. Um, so, um, but you, you, you get like a, a, a salary as well. You get a, a month, monthly or oh, bi-weekly payment, you know, throughout your time here. Yeah, that's, that sounds great. <laughs> do you guys like, a, do you guys like a, not, not only um, us, but like, a, do you have any questions for us? Or even like a Sa Saif, Shiki, Theo, Injun, like do you have anything you wanna discuss in here? I'm actually curious um, about how the tuition fees work in, in your universities. Even though you're, you're um, working for the school, you have these assistantships, does that waive your tuition or do you still have to pay the tuition? And I'm not talking about like semester fees. I mean, like the big chunk of money. Is that still something you have to pay even though you have an assistantship? Yeah. Yeah. We do, we do get like a scholarship, <laughs> but not cover whole thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I guess the, the main like tuition fees, like 
I think if you were just coming here without an assistantship, I think it would be like 26,000 a year or something. I, I, I think that's what it's all. I don't know if that's for the two years. I can't, that was like what, you know, the initial breakdown was like, this is what you don't have to pay. And it's like, great, because I probably wouldn't. Um, so um, yeah, so that that is waived. And then, yeah, it, uh, the the other fees um, are, you know, uh, like your, your health insurance and, yeah. and, and, um, and yeah, smaller fees like that not like the tuition fees here so you know if you it, yeah yeah <laughs> hmm. um also just quick in case anyone else had a last minute question um Renoi had mentioned earlier that anyone can ask a question in Japanese or Mandarin if that's preferred Otherwise, um, I'll ask a question in the meantime. Um, I know, uh, I think, uh, Svive, you, your program's three years, and actually, uh, Sinji, yours is as well. I'm just curious if um, you, um, if all of you would want to talk about why you may have chosen a three-year program over a two-year program or vice versa. Yeah, I, I didn't make that um decision consciously <laughs> that kind of just it's it's how it happened i i actually decided to apply for grad school really late um which if anyone if that happens to anybody siu has a much later deadline <laughs> than all the other schools i could find so the deadline to apply is actually mid february instead of january like a lot of other schools um I hadn't, I actually thought it was a two year program. So I was a little bit shocked when I heard it was three. It's like, oh crap. But now that I've finished my second year, I'm so happy I have a third year. You know, I really, I feel like I'm only getting into it. And I would, yeah, I really appreciate that third year. It's difficult because I, I miss home. I don't necessarily want to stay in the United States. I don't want to settle here, but I do really appreciate that extra year but I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think if I knew there was a three-year program, I probably would have done that. I, I assumed all of them were two years as well. But having an extra year would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, RIT is two years then. <laughs> I don't know, like uh, it's very, I, I think I didn't choose the program because of the three years or two years thing, but like, I sometimes like I wonder if like there's one more year, but but also like uh, I can't graduate earlier, so that that's like a really I don't know maybe help not helpful but like maybe it's just like a let you go to the real world sooner, so maybe yeah. that's another benefit maybe. <laughs> Um, actually, my three years program is contain one year post back and two years grad uh, program. So why is they kind of when I apply recently they encourage me to take the, the one year post back because my my English was not really good and I don't know a lot of, like American culture. Also, I need a lot to know some basic techniques about glass blowing. So that year I was focusing on just just focus on techniques learning. And then start two years. Uh, usually, it's kind of other when other grads they apply to provide um, two years uh, program. Usually, so but it depends on different international students. Some people they have a lot of background experience, and all they are they, their English is super good, so they don't have to take one year post back. Great. <laughs> there we go. I thought I forgot it was needed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank, uh, thank you, Renoy, for moderating this conversation and thank all of our guests today. We also want to take this opportunity to thank everyone in the audience for attending. If you'd like to watch or listen to this program again, the recording will be available within the next week and you'll be able to find it on our website and YouTube channel. And a special thank you to all of our donors. Gas programs, services, and benefits would not be possible without contributions from people like you. 
The next GAS student meetup program will be June 8th, and we'll be discussing the virtual conference. Head over to the GAS website to see the full lineup of presenters and demonstrations and to register for the conference if you haven't already. Thank you and have a good morning, day or night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.